about yourself so everybody can learn about you. Tell us about yourself. Sure. So my name is Dr. Mike Dow. I'm a psychotherapist, a neurotherapist. I'm a New York Times bestselling author. And I'm here today to talk about my new book, Heal Your Drained Brain, which is a natural way for people to relieve stress, anxiety, and insomnia. It's a fast, fast moving world. You know what I mean? Everybody, I'm sure, has it in some way or another. So tell us what really, like, what can people do to kind of like calm that anxiety? What advice do you have for the people to, you know? Yeah. So basically, <laughs> You can turn on the news every single day. You know, there's something crazy going on in our world. You know, I mean, all of these things that are actually shifting our brain. You know, so our brain is always either in a state of rest and digest or fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my book is really all about restoring that balance. So a healthy brain is one that is usually balanced towards that rest and digest. And then if you come across a stressor, let's say your boss says, oh, you have a deadline today at five. It should shift over to fight or flight, but then come back over here. Right. But what's happening today is that we turn on the news first thing in the morning, and it's like, oh, this happened and that happened, and I have a deadline, and I have to pick up my kids at school. So our brains are sort of doing this yes. all the long. And, and so we have what I call the three brain drainers, which are stress hormones. So we have adrenaline, norepinephrine, and cortisol. So these are surging not, uh, not for 15 or 20 minutes or an hour, but basically all day long. And we know that this not only leads to anxiety and insomnia, but also in the long term, it's also associated with some very serious and uh, potentially life-threatening health problems. So I think, exactly. you know, I was really called to write this book because Americans need it now more than ever. Exactly. And tell us, um, so when something, like we said, comes up on the news or something very stressful like that, what's your response? Like, what's the fight or flight action? What, what should everybody kind of do to stop? Like, instead of having a panic attack, what should everybody do to calm themselves or not have your mind triggered to fear? Yeah, so that's such a great question. So uh, I teach my patients to be the expert of you. So, you know, do a, do a body scan and check in with yourself. Okay. If you checking the news is, you know, all of those symptoms, right? So when we go into fight or flight, you'll notice that your breath moves from your belly mm -hmm. up into your chest. Right. Of course, your breath gets faster, sweaty palms, heart beating faster, and anxiety, all of those thoughts start to race. And when you're noticing that happen, you know, it's like, you know, all of these things, you know, our phone, it's like we can't even, uh, we can't even unplug, we can't turn yeah. the ringer off. You know, there's lots of different hacks and tricks, you know, there's there's a setting on the iPhone where you can just uh, uh, change your phone from color to gray, so you're less tempted to be constantly watching the news yes. all day long. All of these little tips and tricks to sort of just check in with yourself um, and, you know, use these little hacks in the book, these little tips. So, you know, I have all these practices uh, in the book that help you to restore the balance. So when you feel yourself getting flooded and you're yes. about to have a panic attack, yes. you know, there's little, there's self-hypnosis, there's autogenic training, there's progressive muscle relaxation. There are all of these tools that can bring you back. When you feel like you're about to fall over the cliff, yeah. you yes. just use one of these natural practices to bring you back. Okay, because a lot of people I know, like, say even they have, like, a, something like habits or something like that, different forms of anxiety, people somehow will, like, I don't know, they'll, like, they'll do different things, they'll, They'll grab a straw and kind of bend it or something like that. You know, the addictive manners they have with anxiety, a form of it. How do you yeah. get rid of those addictive behaviors that you're so nervous that you don't know where to revert the energy? What do you say yeah. to that? Well, you know, first of all, that is information that, you know, first, there's so many stress hormones in your body mm -hmm. that you know, anxiety and stress is not just mental, it's also physical. physical. So when you feel the need to pull your hair or yeah. do something straw or, you know, pick up something and crumple it or fold it. That is because you you have so many stress hormones. And think about this. You know, from an evolutionary point of view, when we were, you know, hunters and gatherers and we felt stress, nature designed our responses to give us the energy to convert, you know, uh, all of the food that we eat into energy to run from a tiger. So nature designed us to actually use that energy in a physical way. So, of course, the modern brain, um, we're not actually discharging that energy. We're not running from the tiger. So here we are, we're sitting at our desk with our phone, with our laptop, with our iPad, with the TV on, and we have all this pent up anger, this, this aggression, this anxiety, this yes. stress, this insomnia. So find a healthy channel. Um, you know, I recommend, you know, sometimes it's, it's about the, the meditative practices. Sometimes it's about, you know, I have a whole exercise you know, uh, a whole chapter on exercise, I call it jogging for joy, right? Oh, okay. And it's about these little practices. Even if you're really busy, you know, I talk about these different forms of, of exercise. 
interval training, sprint interval training, which is, by the way, just a 10-minute form of, of, of exercise where you just push yourself as hard as you can in little 30-second intervals, and the whole format is only 10 minutes long. Oh, wow. You have, you know, uh, uh, cardio, you have weight training, you have uh, yoga, you know, know that nature designed you to, to, to rev, to go. So find a healthy way when you have that habit, you know, I use what's called behavioral replacement therapy. Okay. So, you know, I, I worked a lot. I was the spokesperson for TLC's, um, for, um, my strange addiction and I was the host of TLC's freaky eaters, right? Yes. So this is, this is another one of my, yes. one of my specialties. So I always focused on what I'm adding to a patient's life rather than what I'm taking away. Okay. So if, you, if you're trying to stop biting your nails, instead of focusing on, oh, I have to stop doing this, I have got to stop you know, twirling all of these straws, I would say, what healthier behavior could you add to your life? You know, is, it, is it a little bit of walking meditation? Is it a little bit of interval training? You know, how can you discharge that energy in a healthier way? Exactly. And then another question is, okay, so... A lot of people that do have this anxiety and then they read your book and they're becoming very healed and everything like that, which is great. How do they not go back to their repetitive behaviors before? Because sometimes you could be healed completely. There's always that trigger in your back mind, that your subconscious that says, oh my goodness, that fear comes into play again. Does your book really help like get rid of that fear permanently? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, no, that's also such a great question because we are creatures of habit, aren't we? Ha very and habitual, very bad. You know, all of these, you know, oh, I stopped smoking for 18 years, and then one day there was just something, you know, going yes. through a divorce, and I just, oh, I just picked up that one cigarette, and it led me down that path to smoking again. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and really it's all about those feel-good neurotransmitters. So the opposite of the, what I call the brain drainers, or those stress hormones, are the brain balancers. Okay. So the good news is, is that when you, and you know, we haven't even talked about foods and all of the foods that I recommend that people eat that actually help your body to manufacture serotonin, GABA, all of these healthy brain balancers. And you know what's great about positive reinforcement, when you start to feel good over the course of you know my 14-day program in the book, mm -hmm. or you start to feel good after a month or two months or three months of, of, of changing your life in some way, that usually becomes the rocket fuel for you to just keep on going, keep on going. Yeah. And it is also about knowing your triggers, right? Mm -hmm. So when, when you go through something uh, tough in life. When you are going through that divorce, when you lose that job, that that is that is a a, a warning sign. That is a high risk period for people to relapse into old behaviors, habits. Uh, that is when you should up the self care, up the connection, uh, call your friends more, go to more dinners, uh, yeah. spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. That's when you should be you know go to the spa, get an extra mm -hmm. massage mm -hmm. that week, whatever works for you. Uh, so that you don't fall back into your old ways. Exactly. Okay, so tell us, you have a total of four books, right? There's a total of four, and your most recent, go ahead and tell us about that. Yes, so this is my most recent. It has a beautiful yellow cover, oh, Heal Your okay. Draining Brain, Very Natural good. Relief, Anxiety, Combat Insomnia, and Balance Your Brain in just 14 days. Okay. Uh, I also wrote uh, the New York Times bestseller, The Brain Fog Fix, which mm -hmm. is more uh, geared towards uh, sort of those foggy brains, people with brain fog, depression, and then, you know, uh, as the host of TLC's Freaky Ears, I also wrote a book on food addiction, and that book was called Diet Rehab, which was my first book. Uh -huh. And and then this fall, I am writing my very first uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, uh, which is called Think, Act, and Be Happy. Very cool. I actually also heard from you from um, the Bachelorette Girls. Were you on Ashley Eyes, Ashley and her sister's show? I was, yes. Yeah. So I was Ben the Bachelor's therapist on his uh, free form show and yeah I was recently on Ashley's uh, podcast ah very cool very cool okay so yeah. now tell us a little bit about this brain fog like does it come really just out of the clear blue is it because of stress like stress related things how does the brain fog come about and then why do people just like we said space out just out of nowhere just feel off tell us about that why does that happen yeah so the difference between brain drain you know what I'm talking about in this book this most yes. recent book and the brain fog fix. So a brain, a, a drained brain is one that has too much activity, right? So your brain okay. is sort of, if, if I, I, was, I, I like to compare it to color. So, okay. you know, one of the reasons I, you know, if you look at the co color of this, of this cover, yes. it's yellow and red. Okay. So if, if, if a drained brain had a color, it would be yellow, red, it's frazzled, it's, frazzled. it's stressed out. It's just like always, you know, you have 18,000 things going on, and if you if you get fatigued, it's because you have too much on your plate. Mm -hmm. So the brain fog fix, you know, it's funny, the color of that uh, cover was this this muddy gray. So 
the brain fog, the brain fog fix was really about people who aren't making enough feel good, you know, uppers. So you're not making enough dopamine, or your brain is um, getting clouded by the plaques that eventually lead to dementia. Mm -hmm. So you need to sort of clean out your brain. There's, mm -hmm. It's literally getting foggy, right? So it's really the difference between you know, is your brain slowing down and getting sort of gunky, or is your brain just sort of you know, I, have you put like a thousand, uh, a hundred thousand miles on a car and it's starting to sputter out and you need to sort of put in a new engine. Right. Well, tell us what type of foods then do you recommend that really help that with the brain fog and everything like that? What's those feel good foods that really help? Well, you know, what's great for in both books, part of both programs are omega three superfoods. Omega so in, uh, heal your drained brain, uh, there are two usable forms of omega-3s. So okay. if you eat, like, uh, let's say you have a wild salmon uh, salad for lunch today. Uh -huh. uh, there's going to be two usable forms of omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Okay. So EPA is what I call your stress-less omega-3. Uh -huh. uh, research shows that it can reduce anxiety, stress by about 20%. Uh -huh. uh, and then DHA in that salmon is what I call your sleep soundly omega-3. Okay. Now, no, so it, it works for stress reduction and sleep, but guess what? When I wrote the brain fog fix, research also shows, you know, I, I called um, EPA, I had different names for it, although it's the same wild salmon, the same EPA and DHA. EPA is your feel better omega-3 mm -hmm. because research has also shown that high levels of EPA uh, are just as effective in treating depression as prescription antidepressants. Oh, really? And yeah, and then I call DHA your think better omega-3 okay. because it's been shown to prevent cognitive decline in dementia. So, you know, isn't it so cool that if you have that wild salmon for lunch and you get all those delicious omega-3s, it's mm -hmm. doing so many incredible things for your brain and it's shifting your brain from a state of inflammation. You know, the standard American diet with all the processed factory farmed meats, mm -hmm. that, those are very, very high in omega-6s. Mm -hmm. Having this really clean seafood shifts it over to omega-3s, so you're moving from inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory state. Most Americans are actually suffering from high blood sugar. Yeah. So they're actually fogging their brains with too many, too, many uh, too much sugar, too much uh, flour. If we don't get enough uh, uh, you know, carbohydrates, um, we are also going to be foggy. Remember that mm -hmm. carbohydrates are the brain's uh, preferred source of fuel. But here's the thing. People take that and they think that, oh, that means I need orange juice. That means I need yes. a little soda. That means I yes. need a little you know, bread. That's not what that means. That means that your brain needs uh, organic berries, right? Ah, One of the best foods. Okay. You know, you need whole fruits. Nature did not give us bread. Yeah. You know, nature no. gave us fruit. As nice right. as that is, yeah, no, exactly, yeah. exactly. Na nature didn't give us candy, right? <laughs> right, so nature, exactly. Nature gave us all of these incredible super grains. Nature gave us, you know, uh, wonderful things, you know. Uh, so shifting away from, like, um, uh, you know, the, the bread and moving to quinoa and, and these complete, um, uh, some of these uh, healthier carbohydrates with more fiber and more amino acids that help your brain to um, make these feel-good neurotransmitters. And then also, of course, moving away from fruit juice um, and, and sugar and, and sugary drinks and shifting over to uh, these uh, whole fruits, which, of course, nature designed them to balance our blood sugar mm -hmm. even. So instead of spiking our blood sugar with orange juice, we're getting a nice, slow, and steady rise because that whole apple is going to give us that fiber, you know, and the other great thing is that we have all of these incredible, one of my favorite drinks, all of these incredible stevia sweetened drinks, mm -hmm. uh, because we also don't want to, uh, you know, artificial sweeteners kill good gut bacteria. Yeah. Now our gut is our second brain. So more feel good neurotransmitters like serotonin, but also GABA, acetylcholine, mm -hmm. they're made in our gut and they travel to our brain. Artificial sweeteners kill that good gut bacteria, yeah, yeah. so that can actually cause and contribute to anxiety, depression, right? Yeah, exactly. So we want to shift from these artificially sweetened drinks uh, to, uh, if you do like something a little bit uh, sweet from time to time, mm -hmm. uh, these wonderful um, stevia sweetened beverages, you know, some of my favorites are uh, Vitamin Water Zero, uh, there's some others uh, on the market right now, uh, so they're using that natural form of sweetener. I um, mean, even at Starbucks, you know, they now have a stevia, in, you know, at that at that little coffee bar, so you don't have to. You can move away from the the aspartame and the equal and exactly. all that all that garbage. Exactly, and then tell us about like fatigue and tiredness and just that energy that you're everybody's lacking. Tell us how we can kind of avoid that and why again is that happening?
So we, we need to understand that when you wake up, your cortisol levels, um, that stress hormone. Now, we don't want cortisol to be super high, but we do want to see a little bit of bump in the morning. That sort of wakes you up, right? It's sort of energizing. We call that it's the cortisol awakening response. And then we want to see melatonin go low in the, in the morning because obviously you're going to be waking up. And then at night, cortisol should go down as melatonin goes up. Of course, when melatonin goes up, you get sleepy. And when cortisol goes down, you're not stressed. Right. But what happens when you, okay, look at this, melaton, uh, melatonin high, cortisol low, and then you pick up your phone at 1130 and you see this email from your boss. Well, the low cortisol just went up because now you're stressed out. Yeah. And the blue light from the phone just suppressed melatonin production in the, pine, uh, in the pineal gland in the brain. So now melatonin went low and now you can't sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting great sleep. Now, when you wake up in the morning, you're not sleeping well, and you have reversed these two, these two hormones these, that, that are supposed to be, that are functioning in this natural 24-hour rhythm, and everything that we are doing in our modern world is sort of pushing them out of balance, out of right? Out balance, exactly. But it's just sort of a, a, some natural shifts. You know, you can go into your settings. It's not perfect, but if you are going to use your iPhone, you put it on night shift, so at least it's going to take out some of the blue light. Yes. That it, the most potent at suppressing the melatonin at night. Um, better yet, turn off your ringer and don't use your iPhone a few hours before bed. That's the better thing. That's the best case scenario. I know that's unrealistic for some people. Uh, if you have kids, if you're waiting for calls, um, you know. But it really is about getting that restful eight hours of sleep. We know that when you sleep that good, healthy eight hours, um, your brain goes into a wash cycle. So all of the gunk, all of the plaques. Uh, that eventually lead to, to dementia are hosed down. So what happens is your brain cells move apart and the gunk that's in between gets hosed down and that happens most effectively when you're sleeping. Mm -hmm. So if you're not sleeping, you're not giving your brain that, that time for those brain cells to move apart and get all that gunk hosed down, right? Exactly. So we really want to get be sleeping because eventually that gunk starts to build up where it's sleep deprived, sleep, de sleep deprivation, uh, you know, it slows reaction time, it, it exacerbates anxiety. So now you, ch you were checking your phone all night, you didn't sleep well, you're at the office the next morning, you're stressed out, your reaction time is slowed, so that just, you know, you're missing emails all day, that just makes the anxiety even worse. You do that over the course of years or decades, your brain starts to get gunky, yeah. and eventually that could contribute to actually dementia. Uh, I'm sure, and dementia, yeah. You know, so it, it really is amazing uh, when we sort of come back to these natural remedies, just how just how potent they can be for so many people. Mm -hmm. And the foods that you recommended, how about like for snacks, when everybody gets hungry at like, you know, 3 p.m. afternoon snacks, what do you recommend for just like snack time things, everybody can balance everything out? We know, you know, in all these studies and all of my books, I recommend a modified Mediterranean diet. I, you know, and, and if you're, if you are vegan, there's a way to do that, uh, sort of a, a vegan version of that. We know that there are, uh, that is sort of the best, uh, diet for the brain. Uh, so, you know, in, in, in looking at the modified Mediterranean diet, and when I say modified, you know, when Americans think of Mediterranean, they're thinking of po pasta and spaghetti with meatballs. That's not what I mean. You know, we're looking at, we're looking at, uh, we, we're looking at fish, we're looking at Olive nuts, oil yeah. And, oil. Yeah. you know, so, you know, one of my favorite go-to snacks is the, un, uh, there's this little, there's this bag of nuts at, at Trader Joe's that has a variety of nuts and there's okay. no added oils. Um, you know, when you add oil, like soybean oil or a lot of these cheap oils to nuts, you're shifting it away from the healthy fats that are in the oil and now you're shifting it away from the Mediterranean diet and you know, closer to the yes. standard American diet. That's not what we want. So filling up with a healthy fat, like an, uh, an, un, uh, an uh, a nut with uh, no added oils, you know, popcorn that's been air popped. Mm -hmm. Church mm -hmm. Joe's also has this, this big bag for mm -hmm. two or three bucks. Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, pop, and you can do this at home with an air popper. You take organic popcorn, you okay. use an air popper, and then you mist it with a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. Oh, wow. So again, looking at these healthier healthier snacks, these nuts that are sort of, uh, sort of in, in the realm of the modified Mediterranean diet and, and sort of moving away from the standard American diet. Exactly. That sounded good, actually. Popcorn with all, like drizzled olive oil. Yeah, oh, it all sounds yeah. good to me. It sounds good. Um, and then it. tell us also, how about like for females, female hormones, does it play any effect for anything, how their moods affected anything like this with stress, stuff like that? Tell us about that. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> hormones, hormones can play a, a very large role, especially for some women. So again, this, this, for, for some women, not, not much at all. For some women, absolutely. Yeah. So what you can do is, is, is we know that, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, omega-3s that improve mood, especially that omega-3 EPA, uh, getting these omega-3 superfoods, you know, you do what you can to make sure that your diet is as healthy as possible so that you're, 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 you're actually giving your gut what it needs, the probiotics and the prebiotics that help your gut to make GABA and serotonin that promote a healthy mood, that decrease irritability, right? Uh, exactly. So that when, <laughs> if you do, if, if you are one of these women who have a really rough time when your hormones fluctuate, you have a lot of uh, sort of backups, right? You, mm -hmm. Your your gut is producing enough GABA, serotonin. You're getting enough omega three superfoods that can sort of help uh, to mitigate uh, and, and sort of improve your mood enough so that it doesn't become something that is so terrible that you feel like the world is going to end, right? Mm -hmm. And you also, you know, something else that I have in the book, these cognitive behavioral tools so that you know when you have a thought, you can sort of reframe the thought and know, okay, that's not what I really think. That's ah. the whole thing. And that's in which book of yours that really focuses on that? Which one out of all of them? Uh, heal, your, heal your drained brain. Really uh -huh. looking at these, yeah, looking at these CBT tools. Um, you know, because listen, if you're having the worst day, it doesn't matter if you're, if it's hormones, if it's depression, making a life choice of I'm going to quit my job. I feel so depressed and you're just in the worst funk mm -hmm. and that funk mm -hmm. is temporary. That's a bad time to make a life decision, right? Mm -hmm. So CBT helps people to reframe those thoughts. And, you know, I always say, I think maybe you heard it on my podcast, feelings aren't facts, mm -hmm. right? They're, mm -hmm. they're information. Exactly. So sometimes we have to take them with a grain of salt. And essentially, that's what cognitive behavioral therapy helps people Another to do. Another thing for food-related, what about salt? How do you feel about that salt? Good, bad? What do you have to say about salt? Does your body need it? I mean... Your body needs a little bit of salt. You know, okay. most Americans are eating uh, too much of it. Some... Yeah. Listen, we, there are sort of general recommendations because some people can actually tolerate salt, and for some people, it, it increases their blood pressure. So we have these sort of blanket recommendations uh, so that we're not going to increase uh, you know, risk of heart disease and all that. Uh, now, some people can tolerate it. Some people can't. Uh, if you're a marathon runner, sometimes you can actually become deficient, right? So you want to make sure you're getting enough salt. Uh, 99%, I would say 99 or maybe 95% of Americans are getting too much too salt, much. right? And, and the food companies sort of use this flavor layering. You know, we have these five taste buds, uh, these five different types of taste buds on our, uh, on our tongue, su sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And, you know, they sort of layer sour with sweet and salty so that we start to get these cravings. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. we're craving a salty food. We're also craving savory. We're craving sweet. So now we're getting sugar with salt, with fat. And it's just a disaster for our health, right? So if you're, if you're craving a little bit of salt, that's okay. You know, I, I would say, you know, going back to that delicious snack, the, uh, the extra virgin olive popcorn uh, with a little, maybe a little bit of pink, uh, pink Himalayan salt uh, on the top. But, you know, staying away from the movie theater popcorn with Unhealthy. just you know, the tons of table salt and all the processed foods. We want to stay away from you know, the, those mega doses of sodium that so many American foods are, are, are laced with these days. Exactly. Well, that's some great information you gave us so far with all the food and everything like that. I'm sure everybody's going to learn with that. Um, we're going to switch our topic now to love-related matters. Tell us a little bit about, like, love advice, everything like that. Everybody wants to know if they can't find love in their life so far or haven't found their soulmate, what advice do you have for people to keep on going and do that? I have a mantra, and that is there is a lid to every pot. So mm -hmm. if you have not found your lid... Uh, keep keep on looking. Um, you know, there's just this incredible story that literally, I when I was reading it, you know, in this next book that's coming out in September, uh, my book that I'm doing with Chicken Soup for the Soul. It's uh, it's basically how to use your brain to be your own therapist. So uh -huh. this book starts off with real Chicken Soup for the Soul stories, as all the Chicken Soup for the Soul books do. Uh -huh. And then at the end of the chapter, I tell you, you know, how cognitive behavioral therapy can help you, the reader, and what you know, maybe this person's story, um, taught you. And, you know, I was, and I had to read, uh, oh, I don't know. They sent me over thousands of stories and I had to choose 50, you know, which is hard. And I, I remember reading the story and it's, it's one of the ones, it's one of the stories I chose. And, and she was talking about how hard it is. And, and then she reveals that, you know, she's in a wheelchair, but you know, she's lucky because she has some use of her limbs, but her husband, 
you know, he doesn't have any, and he's a quadriplegic. Oh my goodness. And then, and they talk about their love story, and then they talk about uh, how they wanted to have a child, and how they made that happen, wow. you know, and, 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 you know, we think, I, I cannot believe how many people, how many women that I have treated, I think women more than men, you know, uh, again, sometimes there's an exception to the rule, and I don't mean to generalize, but there's something that in Los Angeles, maybe this is, uh, maybe it's just the women that I have treated. I, maybe this is my sample size. So again, I don't mean to generalize. And, you know, I, I've had men say this to themselves too. But, you know, people get to be 35 and they think, oh, I'm too old. Or, you know, oh, it's never, it's, it's too late right. for me. And why do we say these things to themselves? And then you read the story. And here we have two people who are, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, conventional wisdom would have said, Oh, oh, you're in a wheelchair. You're probably never going to find love. And you're certainly, yeah. if you do find love, you're never going to be able to have a baby and, and raise a family. Yeah. Well, guess what? They didn't let those thoughts and those beliefs hold them back. And they have this beautiful family, right? It's beautiful. I have chills. You telling, I honestly have chills. Like, I'm like, wow, that is beautiful just hearing that. I, I mean, if, if there was a lid to their pot, there's a lid, you know, and not to say that we're, not to say that their, their beliefs, and I believe that all of us should, should say, you know, what are our beliefs and how do my beliefs believe that? If I believe that there is a lid to every pot and there's a lid to my, and I am the pot and I'm looking for my lid. Mm -hmm. And if, if somebody is not right for me, then that was not my train. Uh, and instead of wasting a year pining away over somebody who didn't work out, maybe I just realized that that was somebody else's train and I got to yeah. go look for my train, yeah. looking for the lid to my pot. Maybe we can move on a little bit faster and we can shift to a place of hope and belief and faith. Um, and that's what these, these two incredible people have. And they're just inspirations to all of us, you know, because if there's one thing, if, if, uh, it, it makes me sad when people come into my office, you know, whether they're 30 or 50, whether they're male or female and they come into my office and they don't believe that they're worthy of love because they're too old or they're too fat or they're not good looking enough or rich enough or fill in the blank enough, whatever those thoughts that you tell yourself why you are unworthy of love, mm -hmm. that is what is holding you back. It is not necessarily your age or your weight or your bank account, the number in your bank account. It is certainly your belief. And if there's something that you want to change about that, well, then certainly change that. Obviously, you can't change your age, but if you want to get in better shape, do it. If you want to make more money, be more successful and follow your dream, and then do it. But we also have to know that you know, our beliefs affect our reality, right? Our mm -hmm. thoughts affect our beliefs, our beliefs affect our behavior. And, and, and when we can realize that they're also, it's like a, it's like a domino effect that never ends. Yeah. And we have to realize our role in, and the way that thoughts and feelings all, all sort of play into each other. Mm -hmm. And how about now, um, like soulmates? Do you believe everybody has like a soulmate? Everybody's meant for a certain person? How do you feel about that? I, you know, I do believe in soulmates. I also don't believe that everyone has just one soulmate, but I, you know, I believe in love at first sight for some people. Mm -hmm. I also, mm -hmm. I, but not always, you know, mm -hmm. uh, love is, love is a complicated beast, but you know, I, I believe that some people, you know, the minute they, I've read, I treated couples, they knew the first date. I treated couples who were madly in love and they were best friends for five years and they, mm -hmm. and they slowly fell in love and you know, which one is, is one more valid than the other? Absolutely yeah. not. You know, but there is, there is, uh, but I do believe in soulmates. Uh, but if, if something doesn't work out with one soulmate, do I believe that that was your only one and you're doomed and that was the, the one and only? No. Yeah, uh, you, can, you, you can go find another two. Best friends can know each other for years and not be in love, but then years later, somehow they fall in love? They, yeah, I've seen it happen. And, you know, what's so interesting is, you know, the difference between men and women. Men's brains tend to be very visually oriented, and, and women tend to be, because of their high, higher levels of oxytocin, they tend to want to connect, and, 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 and their brains are, are wired in a, in a different way in many ways. And, you know, it's, it's interesting when you hear these stories and, and when, when love grows out of, of something and you hear one best friend and, they, and they're nervous and they need to, they want to tell their best friend that they're in love with them and, and how hard that is for them. And it's just, some of these stories are just as inspiring as the, the sort of the soulmate love at first yeah. sight stories too, you know, when that, when that, when that story grows out of love, you know, when you're watching a, oh, I don't know, my best friend's wedding or, yeah, I don't know what the romantic comedy version of that is, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I do believe in that. How do you feel about the people like, let's say, let's pick a side, I guess we'll pick the girls then, say the girl likes the guy friend and the, the guy friend, we don't know if like, you know, the guy likes the girl. 
what advice for you have do you have for those people should the girl like tell the guy hey i like you should they kind of wait and see maybe if if they've been friends for years what suggestions do you have for people like that yeah you know i think i think if there are if you have a few signs um i think eventually you have to sort of gather your courage and you have to mm -hmm. sort of uh, take the bull by the horn so to speak and you know what i certainly don't want women to do is uh sort of start reading between the lines and waste two years of your life pining away for your best friend and every time he goes on a date you you know sort of go into spirals of depression you know that's you know in cognitive behavioral therapy we call that psychic thinking you know it's like expecting somebody to read your mind yeah he's not mind reading so unless you verbalize something how does he know for sure that you have feelings for him yeah are you putting something at risk sure but, you know, are you also putting something at risk by going into spirals of depression every time he goes on a date with somebody? And then, and then you know, sort of in subtle ways, even if you're not aware of it, you know, when you're meeting this, this, this woman that he's dating, sort of, um, you know, the looks that you're giving off, you know, sort of repelling her, or, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that, that, caught, that that's putting the friendship at risk in a different way, yeah. right? So I think we have to sort of reframe that to ourselves. Exactly. Do you think a lot of those people, though, in those friendship situations should kind of, like, wait it out, or should they really go date other people? I mean, it kind of is per situation, but what do you suggest for that? You know, listen, I think if they're, if, on a scale of 1 to 10, if your feelings are at a 1 or a 2, I think uh, a lot of true best friends, if you're, if you're a straight woman and you're straight guy, best friend I think it's a little bit normal listen if you have like an inkling like a one or a two maybe that's just some maybe that's just normal you know I think there's a little bit of attraction that's that's just like you know passing and and maybe one time you know at a college party there's you know one too many beers and there's a, a brief makeout session five years ago but if it's nothing if it's nothing if it never goes above a one or a two then you know probably no big deal and yeah date other people if you're like at a seven, an eight, or a nine, and you're dreaming about this guy, and you can't stop thinking about him, and you think he may be the one, then why waste your time, and why waste other men's time, and why break mm -hmm. their hearts when really you're in love with somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So either try to get closure, um, try to figure out what that would look like for you, um, and try to get a yes or a no answer from the person you're really in love with, rather than, you know, sort of spending your whole life trying to figure out how you're going to get what you want and yeah. you know, trying to manipulate the situation. Wouldn't you rather just go directly for what you want? And if you are in love with this person and the person's not in love with you, maybe, maybe sometimes it is about, you know, spending less time with that person. Cause you know, if you are madly in love with with somebody and that person does not feel the same way, you certainly don't want to be spending every single day with that person. Yeah, that no. is not a healthy relationship. So maybe it's a, a matter of minimizing the time. Maybe it's taking a break from that best friend for a while. Um, you know, uh, but I think it's, it's really about the honesty. And as I say, the truth will set you free. Exactly. That's right. And then how do you feel also about like, um, guys with girls, like, do guys kind of like hold back nowadays, do you believe? Like a lot of people, like if they're at a bar and they kind of meet, they don't really tend to go up to girls that many, like that much anymore. You know what I'm trying to say? I, I hear a lot of people like girls, friends, they all, they all say the same thing. How do you feel about that system of today's society with dating? It's kind of different than it was years ago. It, it certainly has changed. I think uh, for, for the better and for the worse, I mm -hmm. think sometimes it, uh, you know, for the better, you know, it, it's 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 sort of now a, the land of equal opportunity. Yeah. So if you are a shy guy, it's no longer up to you to make the first move. It's not up to you to pay for every drink and every dinner. Um, it, listen, women are making just as much money or more than men as they should be. So sometimes that means that women are making the first move. Um, you know, but you know, by the same token, uh, on, well, not by the same token, on the other side of that token, I guess I should say, uh, sometimes that creates a, a little bit of confusion, right? Yeah. So it's sort of like, okay, well, what are the roles? So if he likes me, he's not coming to talk to me. Does that mean he does, is not interested? Right. So now I think there's a little bit of, well, what, what, what that, role am I supposed to That's the big right? question. That is the big question. <laughs> Right. Exactly. So it's so difficult, you know, with today's society and everything like that. And I feel like that's a lot of people struggle just in the dating world, even just figuring out if guy or girl likes them. I feel like that's the no step one. You yeah. know what I mean? So it's kind of hard. It goes back to, you know, make your own rules. You yeah. know, in this day and age, that's the cool thing. You can make your own rules. So instead of deciding uh, how you have to figure it out, just, you know, again, if you if you like somebody, just take a chance, you know. 
there, there's a lot of risk taking when it comes to when it comes to relationships, and of course, the rejection is a little bit tricky for some for some people. Obviously, it doesn't feel good, but isn't it also so incredible uh, to be able to take that risk and, and to be able to say, "Hey, I like you," and, and to see and to see what that feels like, uh, and to and what that means for you and in, in your confidence and, and taking a risk for love. Exactly. I know it's so empowering to actually do that. And then if it works out in your favor, it's such a beautiful thing. So why not yeah, even try right. it? You know what I mean? So yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much. It was so great talking with you. You too. And Thanks for having else, me. Your books, everything like that. Any other new projects coming up? Everybody can stay tuned. I'm going to be uh, on, i got to look at my calendar here. Uh, I'm going to be uh, on the Dr. Oz show uh, talking about my new book on uh, the 28th of this month in just a few weeks. Oh, exciting. Uh, yeah, and I have a few uh, new TV projects hatching that I can't yet talk about, but uh, hopefully something soon. Okay, not okay, so a lot of new things coming up for you. We're so excited, and everybody else is too, and everyone needs to check out your books, all four of them, not just the new, all four, because they're all incredible, so everybody has to check them out. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.